there are grounds for saying it, it's been successful, but they're, they're rather limited. So uh, if you recognize that the reason for going to Afghanistan in the first place was to remove the sources of terrorism that had, that had inflicted 9-11 on the, on the US, well, that was successfully accomplished. And uh, as things stand today, Afghanistan is not being used as a, as a haven for, for terrorism, but the future looks much more uncertain than it did when uh, the US-led Western forces were in the country. And I think the second thing that the, um, America is making very clear is it, it can't see any profound strategic national interest to remain propping up a, a Afghanistan. And they've other things to focus on. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with that. I, I think that uh, they'll find that the outcome in Afghanistan is not in America's strategic interests. When you deployed to Afghanistan in 2009, it was part of an effort to persuade the Taliban to, shall we say, rejoin society. Um, that didn't work, did it? No, it, it didn't work, although you know, I think we were the start of a process that, that has run through right through to, to, to this year. But I think underlying that was the, the, the really key thought that, that this struggle in Afghanistan uh, should, could have been brought to a close by a discussion between the Afghan Taliban, who after all are Afghans, and uh, the other interests in Afghanistan, and, and that would have resulted in a, in a sharing of power, but in a much more uh, manageable way than we're seeing now, and with the preservation of many of the advantages uh, that have been gained over the last um, 20 years. Th this was never a war until the last two weeks that was going to result in military victory, and it needn't have been so. Why do you think the Allies were so keen to leave Afghanistan? Oh, oh, I, let me rephrase that. Why do you think the US was so keen to pull out of Afghanistan? Was it for domestic political reasons, do you think? Or was there some wider plan? No, I, I think this was driven by uh, domestic uh, political reasons, infected by the very difficult uh, outcome in, in Iraq and, and the sense that the deployment in Afghanistan wasn't, wasn't going anywhere. Set against that, we have to recognize is that the size of the American deployment and, uh, and uh, the activities that they were, that they were conducting were, were absolutely uh, manageable by the US and, and, and by the West. I think the US taxpayer was still making a mighty contribution to, to Afghanistan, but the military effort was frankly pretty modest. So, so I think this was for domestic political reasons to, to end the forever wars. I don't think it was really about the, the, the cost of the commitment. Were you surprised at the speed of the takeover? I think the, the, the truth of it is that the um, Afghan national security forces had the numbers and the capability and the training to hold the line, uh, but they then saw a number of things happening that completely undermined that. So they immediately asked themselves, well, why would I fight for this district or province when the local people have now swung over to the Taliban. And then they looked over their shoulders and they saw that the American effort that supplied intelligence, air power, logistics, uh, and planning guidance had disappeared. And then they saw their own political and military leaders uh, of very mixed quality uh, evaporating. And in those circumstances, um, they fell away. And it feels very like what we saw in, Iraq, in Mosul in Iraq some years ago. So it was basically the local population uh, in the regions, uh, the districts, thinking, OK, well, the Americans aren't going to be here for a while. We might as well welcome the Taliban. And is that sort of a begrudging welcome, or is there any kind of genuine welcome of the Taliban taking so, over? That's a very good question, and, and I think the answer is, is very complex. There are undoubtedly places in Afghanistan, particularly in the more rural areas, where the population sees the Taliban as a better thing than the government that came from Kabul. The Taliban taxed them less, um, provided order and security in a way that many Afghans uh, recognized and allowed them to continue to, to grow as much poppy as, as they could. And, and, you know, poppy is, after war, the, the major export of, uh, of Afghanistan. So there are some Afghans who see this as not a bad thing. They'll, they'll be a mobus vivendi and it, it'll be okay. There'll be other Afghans that are ambivalent about it. They'll, they'll put their head down and they'll hope just to, to carry on. And loyalty in Afghanistan for, for, for centuries has essentially been a bought commodity. And then, my goodness, there are many, many Afghans, particularly those in the cities, for whom this is a catastrophe. This is 
casting them back literally to the Dark Ages. The big fear now in the West, in European capitals and in Washington, is that it will become a base for jihadists. Uh, ISIS and al-Qaeda are quoted, their spokesmen are saying they welcome uh, the return of the Taliban. Uh, would it be a centre for terrorism again, do you suspect? So I think the Taliban know to say loudly, clearly and often that they'll not allow this to happen in Afghanistan. I think the truth is that it may well be beyond the capacity of the Taliban to prevent it everywhere in Afghanistan. And I'm pretty sure there are some elements in the Taliban, which is, a, which is not a monolithic organisation, that will think that, you know, this will be quite a cool thing, that al-Qaeda can come back and they can shake their fists at the West. But the surest way for a Taliban-led Afghanistan uh, to attract um, the sort of attention it doesn't want from the international community, which will include from the US and, and China and many other places, is to allow this to happen. And then I think there's a second dimension is that this this a victory for a very conservative Islamic mission in, in Afghanistan. When embolden uh, violent religious extremism, terrorism that's elsewhere in the world, they'll think their time is coming again. So this, this problem won't just be in Afghanistan. And, and lastly, General, do you think this will have any lasting effect on Western military policy? You know, I truly, truly hope so, because um, I, I think this is such a shock. This is such a blow to Western standing, reputation and strategic interests that it's going to cause some introspection. And I think the absolutely vital point for the West and many other nations that will come out of this is, is that this has turned out, out badly. We essentially gave up and left, and, and the outcome is not the one at all that we would have chosen. But we're now looking at a world which will be um, challenged by the, the rise of, of Asia and China in this century, um, by the profound instability that climate change is going to cause to societies, economies, and relationships between states, um, and the shock of the digital age in the way that it fractures industries and societies and cultures in, in ways that are going to be, I think, genuinely historic. And I think the question for the West is, this, this didn't go well. We didn't stand up for our interests. But then we'll recognise that our interests, our true strategic interests in Afghanistan were pretty modest. But just coming down the road, there are things that are going to happen in our world where every nation is going to have to stand up with its friends to protect its security and its prosperity and its values and its interests. And the West is going to have to rediscover the will and the capability uh, to go abroad and do that with, it, with its partners, or it'll just get pushed around. And, and I think that is the key strategic question that's come out of this debacle. General Sir Richard Barons, many thanks to you for joining us here on the agenda. Thank you very much.